I was preparing to leave for a luncheon appointment with a friend of mine named Kevin when my phone rang one day. And um, it was Kevin on the other end of the line, and he said, Craig, uh, I was just wondering if you would mind if I invited a guest to lunch with us today. And of course, I said, sure, as long as he's paying, right? <laughs> and uh, so uh, I got to the restaurant that day, and my friend Kevin's sitting there, and he introduces me to his friend, Tim. Uh, Tim, I'll try to describe him to you. He, was, uh, he had kind of black curly hair, glasses. He was of average height. Um, actually, the word average would probably describe him perfectly. My first impressions of him were that he's just kind of an average, normal guy. Um, but I soon, or I eventually discovered that average did not dis describe Tim at all. The more we got to know each other, I soon discovered, for example, that he was a triathlete. Did anybody here a triathlete? Really? Nobody? <laughs> well, you, even, you guys know what a triathlete does? I, I didn't until I met Tim. Well, a triathlete is, is kind of like a marathon guy, but a, a marathon person who runs marathons, they run, right, for like 26 miles. Well, a triathlete they run, and they bike, and they swim, and it's like for 100 miles all at once. Can you believe that? That's craziness, which the reason why I tell you that is that the average person would uh, not pursue that, if you know what I mean. Um, then one day I discovered that my friend, by the way, he was about, um, at the time, he was probably in his mid to, to late 30s. One day, just in the course of conversation, I discovered that he was a big wig at a company there in the Quad Cities. And I thought, he's smart, but I'm thinking, when you're that young and you've achieved that level of success, it was just, it was very unusual, certainly not average. And then when I thought I couldn't learn anything new or amazing about my friend Tim, I discovered that he was actually an author. He wrote a book and had actually somebody published it. He was, he was one of the most amazing, not average people I have ever met in my life. Now here's my question. Have you ever had someone like that in your life? Someone who maybe when you first met them, you just thought, well, they are who they are. They're just like everybody else. But the more you got to know them, you began to realize just how amazing they really are. Have you ever met anybody like that? Well, listen to me. I don't know if you've got somebody in mind like that or not, but I'm here to tell you that the vast majority of you here today probably have met someone like that. In fact, I would go so far as to say to you that it's the same person. And who is that person? Well, he's known by a lot of different names, but primarily he's known as the Holy Spirit. He is the third person of the Trinity. Now, if you were with us uh, the last few weeks, we've been in this, as I alluded to earlier in my prayer, we, we are in the middle of a, um, a sermon series that's entitled The One, Two, Threes of PBC. And the purpose of this sermon series is to delve into the core beliefs of Christianity, first of all, but specifically to understand the core beliefs and the core values of Prairie Bible Church because we're leading towards our, our um, celebration Sunday, which is going to be on June 9th. In the last few weeks, we've been talking about who God is. Uh, and we've discovered that God, uh, we believe in something called the Trinity, right? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And today, um, we're going to be um, discovering things about the person of the Holy Spirit, this amazing person that all of you have met, I suspect, but you really don't know. So if you're ready, uh, let's, let's get to know this guy. Um, first thing I want you to know about the Holy Spirit, as we already said, is the Holy Spirit, like the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit is God, which means that he has been around from the very beginning, he, he's always existed, just like the Father and the Son. And as evidence of that fact that the, that the Holy Spirit was around even before the creation of the world, it says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, that the Holy Spirit hovered over the face of the water as the earth was coming into being. 
You already knew that though, didn't you? You knew that the Holy Spirit is around forever and um, was there at the creation. But let me tell you something that maybe you didn't know about the person of the Holy Spirit. Did you know that the Holy Spirit, um, in the Old Testament times especially, unlike today, the Holy Spirit's activity was very targeted. Maybe that's maybe the best way to say it. The Holy Spirit was only active in certain ways and in certain people's lives. Uh, the Holy Spirit was only active in the lives of people like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. The Holy Spirit was only active in the lives of the kings like Saul and, and King David and Solomon and, and in the lives of the prophets. Now, why would that be? Because back then, the primary purpose of the Holy Spirit was to be involved in the lives of these people that were specifically to bring the plan of salvation, God's plan of salvation into being. So the Holy Spirit targeted his activity into those particular people's lives. But one day, that would all change. In fact, um, in John chapter 14, we had that scripture read for us today. Jesus one day was sitting down with his, with his um, buddies and he said to them, he said, listen, um, I need to share some things with you. And he shared a whole bunch of stuff there in, in John chapter 14. But he said this, and this was one of the things that was most shocking to them. He said, you need to know that things are about to change. I'm going to leave. And they're going, wait, wait, what are you talking about? And he, and he didn't get into the details at that particular point. But he said, listen, I'm going to leave. And he said, but it's okay. In fact, it's a good thing that I'm going to leave. Because when I leave, the Father is going to send a helper right? We just heard about the helper. And there's different words and different ways, depending on the translation of the Bible that you read. But this helper um, was also known as the advocate. He advocates for us to the Father. He was also known as the comforter. He, was all, he is the Holy Spirit. And he said, when I leave, God's going to send you the helper. And he's going to be available to everybody, which is kind of cool. So, in Acts chapter 2, um, that's when, when it happened. This promise of Jesus, the coming of the helper, actually came to fruition. In Acts chapter 2, it says that, that the people who'd accepted Jesus into their heart as Lord and Savior had gathered, and there was only just a few of them. There was probably less than 100 people at that particular point that had confessed Jesus as, as Lord and invited him into their lives. They had all gathered in a room, just as Jesus had told them to do, and to wait. And suddenly, it says in Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, that there was this violent wind from heaven came and descended on that place. And everybody who had accepted Jesus into their heart as Lord and Savior was filled with the Holy Spirit. And the power of the Holy Spirit came upon them. And from that day forward, everyone who has confessed Jesus as their Lord and Savior, from that moment on, everyone, and that includes you, if you've accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, every person who has ever le lived has available to them the power of the Holy Spirit, the help of the Holy Spirit. Now, that's pretty awesome. But you might be saying, well, I, I, I'm not questioning what you're saying, Pastor, but I'm not exactly sure I'm recognizing when the Holy Spirit is at work in my life. Well, let me help you, okay? Because the, the Bible is filled with evidence of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. For example, in John 16, 7, it says that the Holy Spirit works in our life by bringing conviction. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's in those moments when, when you start, when you have this gnawing feeling inside of you. And you know that that feeling says, I need to be, I should be doing this, or I shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> Maybe that happens more, more often than not, I don't know. That is the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Now, some people say, well, that's just my conscience. Well, if, you've, if you're a Christian, I'm guaranteeing you right now, what you're feeling is the conviction of the Holy Spirit. That's what it says in John 6, 16, 7. Um, the Bible also teaches us that the Holy Spirit is present in our lives. This is in Romans 8, 26. It says that the Holy Spirit is present in our life to help us to pray. Have you ever had those moments in your life when you, you just didn't have the words to express what you're feeling? You're, maybe you're heartbroken or, 
or there's someone in your life that you care about and you just don't know how for sure how to pray for them, it says in Romans 8.26 that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us with groans too deep for words. So in those moments when, you, when you're afraid that your prayers, you're not articulating your prayers the way you need to, take heart. Because the Holy Spirit is interceding for you with the Father to give the word that is in your heart to the Lord. It says in 1 Corinthians 2.14, it says that the Holy Spirit is there in your life in moments of revelation, in those aha moments. Have you ever had those moments when you're reading your Bible? You've read your Bible, you've read that same verse a thousand times, and all of a sudden you're reading it and going, that's what that means. You ever had that happen? How could that, I, how did, I read that a thousand times and I'm just getting it today. You want to know why you're just getting it today? Because the Holy Spirit says this is the day you're supposed to be getting this. Because the Holy Spirit is active in your life. Moving in your life and revealing things to you exactly when you need it. In the times that you need it. You see? See how the Holy Spirit, it's, it's like that friend that's been in your life. And the, that the more you, you get to know this friend and all that you're, this friend is and all that this friend does, you're, you're, you find yourself more and more amazed by this guy. That's the Holy Spirit. And I'm here to tell you that this, this Holy Spirit will never stop amazing you if you keep trying to discover more about who he is. For example, did you know that on the day that you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, on that day, the Holy Spirit gave you a birthday present? He did. It's called the gift of the Spirit. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, other places in the Bible, by the way, too, but there's a big long list in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 in particular that lays out all the gifts of the Spirit. The, this, and everybody that has ever accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior has at least one of these gifts that's found in the Bible. Now these gifts, some of them are, are, are um, gifts that you're familiar with probably, things like teaching and administration, um, but others are more unusual things that you may not be aware of or maybe that you didn't even know existed, things like prophecy. There are still prophets today. Things like um, um, healing, supernatural healing and discerning of spirits and speaking in tongues. You're going, what in the world is all that stuff? Well, the better you get to know this person of the Holy Spirit you could have one of these gifts. And you're saying, I know, this is what, I want that one. Or I want this one over here. Well, listen to me. That's not the way it works. It's not your prerogative to get to choose which one of these gifts uh, you want for your spiritual birthday. It is the prerogative of the Holy Spirit to decide which of these gifts he's going to give. And it is your prerogative, or your responsibility, maybe better said, it is your prerogative responsibility to mature and grow in the faith so that God, so that the Holy Spirit can use those gifts within you to minister to the world for the sake of the gospel. You see, here's the deal. Um, I would venture to say that there's a, a large majority of us in this room today that don't even know what, what their spiritual gifts are. You may have been Christian for most of your life, and you may not even know what your spiritual gifts are. You want to know why? Because it's your responsibility. It's not my responsibility as your pastor. It's your responsibility as a Christian to invest in your faith, to mature and to grow, so that as you mature and grow, those, those gifts will become available to you. They've been set aside from the day you, were, you accepted Jesus. But they only become available to you until you're mature enough as a Christian to be able to use them for the sake of the gospel. Because here's, here's what these gifts are for. Even though they belong to you, they're not for you. That seems kind of weird, isn't it? But it's true to the nature of God. You see, the nature of God is that... 
as you grow and you mature, you realize it's really not about you. It's about others. And those gifts that God has set aside to be used in you are to be used for others by the power of the Holy Spirit. Whew, that's a lot of stuff, isn't it? Actually, the things that we've learned the last three weeks about the Trinity, that's a lot of stuff. So let me just stop this morning and try to summarize everything that we've learned the last three weeks by saying this. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Each one has a unique expression of the nature of God as its purpose, as his purpose. But I'm going to let you in on a little secret. All this stuff that I've shared with you about God can actually be boiled down into one word. Who is God and what is the purpose of God? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Love. It says in 1 John chapter 4, it says, Therefore love one another, for love is from God. Those who do not love are not born of God. For, listen to me, for God is love. It's as simple and authentic as that. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, um, Papa, Holy Spirit, there are times in my life, just as I'm preaching this sermon, I'm feeling overwhelmed, trying to, to understand all that you are and what it all means to me and what it ought to mean in me. And I will spend eternity, we will spend eternity trying to know and understand you fully. But when the scripture tells us that, that even a child knows the truth, that we should come to you as a child, we know that ultimately it is as simple as love. You are as simple as love. And as we strive to learn to know and to understand you better, and in those moments when we feel like we're getting overwhelmed by the, by the magnitude of it all, let us never forget that it's really as simple and as authentic as love. In Jesus' name, amen.